Okay, so this video is about Invasion Block, the first ever block where the cards were designed around having a bunch of colors, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the first time multicolored cards appeared in Magic, and that was in Legends, back in 1994. Legends is, uh... <laughs> Well, it's a little uneven. Some of the cards were stupidly good, others were bad beyond belief. The common thread that two groups of cards share is that they're pretty underdeveloped. The cards are wordy, but not in a way that's particularly enjoyable. What Legends cards are, and this is what helped make it one of the most revered sets of all time, is evocative. They are cool. Nether Void is pure misery to play against, but it's got a vibe to it. Kobolds are pretty doofy, but they're free. Presence of the Master is a train wreck all its own, depicting a real-world human being that actually walked the Earth for... dubious payoff. <laughs> the multicolored cards are similarly confusing. Famously based on Dungeons & Dragons characters created by Richard Garfield's classmates at Penn, the multicolored cards in Legends weren't exactly consistent. For example, Kei Takahashi, a white-green 2-2 for 4, prevents damage. Lady Calaria, who is also white and green and is a 3-6 for 6, deals damage to attacking or blocking creatures. They didn't really have color pair identities figured out at this point, so they based multicolored cards on things one of the colors did and went from there. I could go deeper on the absurdity of the 90s, but that's a topic for another day. Invasion debuted in September 2001. Big sets hit in the fall back in the day just like they do now. Fun fact, Invasion was my first ever pre-release. I kinda remember it. I was 12, so you know. A few of the locals kindly built my deck for me, which I appreciate in hindsight. I remember a few of the cards I had in my deck. I had an Elfame Palace, a Quirion Elves, and a Ray of Dawnbringer that I thought was the best card ever. My buddy Joe opened a foil Jade Leech and we all thought he was the luckiest dude on the planet, which... I mean, can you imagine getting excited about opening this card now? Gugh. I mean, look at this cycle of cards. They're like Moxes, but in reverse. Get it? These are bad. <laughs> but they give an idea of just how bad creatures were back then. A 1-3 for 1 needed a drawback. Incredible. Here's a cycle that really drove the multicoloredness of Invasion home. By current standards, they are unplayable on rate, but they also have a drawback built in. These cards were designed to be splashed. You can't really play Halim Jin in a mono red deck, it needs to be the only red card in play, or you need to be either way ahead or way behind your opponent, so the Jins are either win more or lose less. Not great. You never know it by looking at the multicolored cards in Legends, but, as we've mentioned in past videos, restrictive mana costs are a way to justify printing more powerful cards. Enforcing a two-color minimum on a card counts as a restriction. The actual degree of restriction something like Fires of Yavamaya imposes is up for debate, but on paper, it's harder to cast than Fervor is, so it gets to do more stuff. That philosophy extends to all the multicolored cards, hence the baseline power level going up. When people talk about getting hyped for the next Ravnica or whatever the multicolor set is, that fact is where the hype is born from. The other thing that sticks out in my mind from the Invasion pre-release is that it was the first set with split cards and no one had any clue what they were or what was happening. Everyone at my store thought they were printing errors until the shop owner, who was older and way better at magic than anyone else in the room, calmly pointed out that the tournament pack came with a little pamphlet inside that explained what split cards were, how they worked, and that they were, in fact, awesome. But yeah, this was way before the internet became ubiquitous, so there weren't things like preview seasons and exclusive spoilers, you just got sets. And sometimes you got two cards on one piece of cardboard that made you think there had been a mistake at the printers. Who among us hasn't experienced that old chestnut, am I right? I remember the chase rares in Invasion pretty well. They're only fun to talk about because they're so silly compared to the standards of rares these days. For example, the most expensive card in the set was this thing, which is hysterical because a lot of my contemporaries were recently whining about Precision Bolt. Imagine Precision Bolt, but with a kicker cost of a bajillion and a $20 price tag and you basically have Urza's Rage. No complaints though, this card was genuinely good back then. Two more cards that were pretty sweet, Absorb and Undermine. Undermine was the more expensive one, especially after Psychotog came along in Odyssey, but this two card cycle did a good job clearly illustrating the different directions that different colors can pull an idea toward. They weren't particularly elegant, but they were simple and they resonated with people. The idea was easy to grok. The double blue part countered the spell, but with a different complementary color comes a different secondary effect. Invasion was all about allied color pairs. If you don't know what those are, take a look at the back of a magic card. All five colors are accounted for. Each color has two colors next to it. Those colors are allies. The colors that aren't next to it are enemy color pairs, and Invasion focused on allied pairs and what each allied color combination should do with some clever reprints of cards that did just that in the past. Did you know Factor Fiction used to be restricted in Vintage? That is true. It's really funny to think about. Obviously, it's unrestricted now, but yeah. 
Factor Fiction used to be on the same restricted list as Yawgmoth's Will, Ancestral Recall, Black Lotus, etc. <laughs> oh boy. It was unrestricted in September 2011, but for 10 years, at least four or five too many, an invasion card was restricted in Vintage. Like Undermine, Factor Fiction saw the most play in Standard after Psychotog got printed, but the thing about Factor Fiction is that it takes the skill difference between two players and it lays it bare on the battlefield. If you're playing against someone newer to Magic and you cast Factor Fiction, they might arrange the cards in a way that basically ensures that they lose on the spot. There are more cards in Invasion that involve making piles, but the only one that saw any play was the blue one you could play at instant speed. There hadn't been a Yogel Hop since, well, Yogel Hops, but Invasion featured the mother of all board sweepers. Obliterate. What a card! Can't be countered, can't do anything about it. For the low, low cost of 8 mana, all of everything can just go away. Once they realized that people generally want to play their spells, they stopped making cards like this. What a shame, right? The real stars of the show, so to speak, were the primeval dragons of Dominaria harking back to the original Elder Dragons from Legends. None of these cards saw a ton of play, but remember, Invasion came right after Prophecy, and despite the fact that Prophecy is one of the worst sets in the game, its cycles of rares resonated with the casual crowd. With the Primeval Dragon cycle, Watsi attempted to bottle lightning twice, and it was successful! You gotta remember, this was pre-Aldrazi. These dragons used to pass as ginormous back then. Planeshift continued the allied color theme, but with some hosers strewn in. As we've noted before, magic mechanics used to be internally competitive within blocks. They were like that for a long time, which is shocking considering what a negative effect it has on gameplay, but yeah, magic used to do that. Invasion rewarded lots and lots of colors and Planeshift punished colors. It also rewarded lots of colors too, but I don't know, Planeshift was weird. The set didn't have much to offer competitive play, but there are a couple cards worth talking about. But before we get to the good cards, I would like to talk for a moment about Singe. Singe is my least favorite card of all time. I hate it. I have no idea how it played out in Limited because Invasion Block Limited was stupidly complex and I was 11 when Planeshift came out. All I know is that I didn't get why Singe had to exist. I hate to bring up the whining about Precision Bolt again, but I ask you, person complaining about Precision Bolt for engagements on social media, why don't you try opening Singes and Aurora Griffins in a booster pack and then get back to me about the acceptable level of crap a magic card should be? Do you know how many sea snins I could have killed if I'd had Precision Bolt instead of stupid Singe? The thought of it literally keeps me awake at night. But enough about the cards that haunted me when I was in sixth grade, let's get to the good stuff Plane Shift had to offer. Meddling Mage isn't known for its tournament pedigree, but it's currently dominating Modern as the part of the human's deck that makes it good against combo. Terminates a player in Modern 2, albeit in Jund, which we all know isn't a real deck anymore, no matter how badly you want it to be. When Plane Shift first came out, Query and Dryad was busted and extended, a format that was kind of like how Legacy is now but doesn't really exist anymore, and Vintage. There weren't enough cheap card draw spells and reliable mana fixing to make the card very good in standard, but Quirion Dryad alongside Gushes fueled by tropical islands made for big creatures really quickly. Quirion Dryad decks went by the moniker Miracle Grow back in the day, even though literal miracles wouldn't be a thing in Magic for another 11 years after Plane Shift hit. The Plane Shift card I've probably cast the most personally is Phyrexian Scuda. It's like Juzum Jin but easier to cast and its drawback is up front. Phyrexian Scuda is awesome. I know Juzum Jin is cooler and its art is better, but I don't care. Scuda never let me down. He's my best friend. But it's hard to argue that the most influential plane shift card is in Flame Tongue Kavu, or FTK, as it was known back in the day. Were there cards like FTK before it came along? Sure. Necrotel is a pretty obvious comparison point, and Nuktabi Orangutan, Cloud Chaser Eagle, and even Man of War are similar, but none of those present very threatening clocks. FTK, on the other hand, is a giant cockroach. Only five hits from that thing, and you're dead! Its impact on players is clear to me. When Ravenous Chupacabra was revealed during Rivals of Ixalan preview season, it wasn't referred to by players as another Necrotal, it was another FTK. Which brings us to Apocalypse. Conventional wisdom states that third sets are usually pretty bad. They are the house guest that has overstayed their welcome. By the time a third set rolls around, everything's rote. The setting is boring, the mechanics are stale. Apocalypse is the exception to the third set rule. This set was awesome. Maybe part of it is that the flavor of the two sets actually built towards something and Apocalypse was the culmination of all of it. This is barely scratching the surface of the lore stuff, but the Weatherlight Saga that began in Weatherlight wrapped up with Apocalypse and by extension the story of Urza and the entire Brothers War stuff that kicked off in friggin antiquities, it all ends in Apocalypse. So you could say there was a lot of pressure on Apocalypse to be a proper send off, and I think it was. Instead of honing the functions of allied color pairs established in Invasion and Plane Shift, Apocalypse flipped the script and shone a spotlight on enemy color pairs instead. 
and in so doing completed a cycle of lands from six years earlier. Players were pretty hype about the callback to Ice Age, but this was just the tip of the iceberg of Sweet Cards Apocalypse had to offer. I, I had to start here. It's impossible to quantify why exactly Spiritmonger rules, but I'm going to give it a shot. The art is difficult to parse, but it's weirdly satisfying anyway. It looks like something out of Hellboy. Let's talk about the rate. This thing is a 6-6 six, six for 5 with no drawback. That was straight up unheard of 17 years ago. I opened a Spiritmonger at the Apocalypse pre-release, and thanks to the wonderful gift of hindsight, I can confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was a life-altering event. I knew I liked magic at that point, but opening Spiritmonger, Devouring Strassus, and Blazing Spectre, and kicking people's teeth in with my rares, that is when magic sunk its teeth into me for life. I love how clean this card is. It's a one-word name, the art's simple, the rules text is just three words, and the flavor text is straight and to the point, a representation of the moment the reluctant hero avid flavor text readers loved to hate for half a decade finally embraced the events Urza set in motion for him millennia ago. It also helped that the card was extremely good at the time, totally unlike any card printed before it. Just a clean answer to anything, one of the rare times in Magic where form matched function. When Apocalypse hit, Pernicious Deed was correctly identified right away as ludicrously powerful and still sees fringe play in Legacy to this day. The place you're most likely to see it these days, though, is in Cube Drafts. Unlike Vindicate and Pernicious Deed, Prophetic Bolt didn't really break new ground, it was just a lightning blast and an impulse stapled together, but that's pretty good. Similarly, Suffocating Blast wasn't a groundbreaking card that did something new, but not all cards have to be that, you know? Sometimes a hyper-efficient two-for-one is all you really need. The truth is I could go on about Apocalypse and Invasion Block forever, but I can't. So instead, I'll point out that I write a newsletter for TCG Player every week, and if you want to subscribe to that, the link's in the description. Let us know what your favorite old school block is, and then like and subscribe to the TCG Player channel, because y'all are basically the reason we get to do this. With that said, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.